Hi, everyone. I'm your host, Michael Fox. Before we begin today's episode of Under the Shadow, a quick note. If you haven't listened to episode one, where we introduce the series, I suggest you go back and do that now. It really sets the scene for this episode and the rest of the podcast. Okay, here's the show. So right now I'm standing in front of La Torre Supermarkets. And then there's this, there's this mall here, right, with a couple banks and, uh, I don't know, a little movie theater, and a little food court type thing. That's on one end. And then on the other side is the highway that runs, kind of cuts straight through the middle of town. Crazy industrial, crazy industrial highway. And then people are selling things, kind of vendors selling fries and, you know, fruit, vegetables, pools over here, some pools. And right beside, actually underneath, where there is now this mall on the side of this major highway, this is where the rails used to run. These rails used to take the bananas from here in Tikisate all the way to the port over on the Caribbean side, on the other side of the country. In Tikisate, the steam engines are long gone, but the economic interests the railroad represented shaped the course of Guatemalan history in ways that are still playing out today. This is Under the Shadow, a new investigative narrative podcast series that walks back in time to tell the story of the past by visiting momentous places in the present. I'm your host, Michael Fox, longtime radio reporter, editor, journalist, the producer and host of the podcast Brazil on Fire. I've spent the better part of the last 20 years in Latin America. I've seen firsthand the role of the U.S. government abroad. And most often, sadly, it is not for the better. Invasions, coups, sanctions, support for authoritarian regimes. Politically and economically, the United States has cast a long shadow over Latin America for the past 200 years. In each episode in this series, I will take you to a location where something historic happened, a landmark in revolutionary struggle or foreign intervention. Today, it might look like a random street corner, a church, a mall, a monument, or a museum, but every place I'm going to bring you was once the site of history-making events that shook countries, impacted lives, and left deep marks on the world. I'll try to discover what lingers of that history today. We'll dive deep into the past, and I'll take you there with me on Under the Shadow. So in the last episode, we set the scene for this series. We looked at the Monroe Doctrine and visited Tapachula, the Mexican town right on the border with Guatemala, to get a clear sense of the U.S. role in Central American migration going back decades. Today, we look at the outsized role of the U.S. banana corporation United Fruit in Central America. You literally can't talk about the history of Central America in the 20th century without mentioning it. We travel to the Guatemalan town of Tiquisate, which was built by the company. We dig into the past and the legacy today. This is Season 1 Central America, Episode 2, Guatemala, United Fruit. Construction of Guatemala's railroad began in the late 1800s, but the Tiquisate branch became important in the 1930s. Tiquisate was the major center of banana plantations operated by the United Fruit Company. And those bananas needed to get from the Pacific lowlands to the ports on the Caribbean, nearly 300 miles away. The final destination was, of course, U.S. kitchens. Within 12 hours, 10 million bananas have been taken aboard and the ship is on its way to the United States. From New York, New Orleans, San Francisco and other ports in the United States, Bananas are shipped by rail across country in special cars that are kept cool in summer, warm in winter. Like the plantations themselves, the railway was owned and operated by United Fruit. Founded in 1899 in Boston, United Fruit quickly grew to be the dominant force in the region. In addition to the banana plantations and railway, it also ran the post office. It ran the telegram service. By the 1930s, with a dictator in power, United Fruit had amassed hundreds of thousands of acres of Guatemalan land, and it was the country's single largest landowner. Its reach was so ubiquitous, people called the company El Pulpo, the octopus. In the grip of its tentacles, 
the countries of Central America became known as banana republics. I interviewed Stephen Striffler, author of the book Banana Wars, to get some context here. It was, again, this kind of incredible sort of economic power whereby these companies came to control kind of entire regions and entire economies and and developed what sort of became sort of thought of as enclaves to a certain extent. But that along with that came wielded sort of and brought kind of and they cultivated right political power. That is that that they were often seen as calling the shots, calling the dominant sort of political shots within these countries, which seems bizarre, right, that 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 foreign companies involved in the production of bananas would have such an outsized political influence that it became sort of like, wow, these are the companies that are controlling the governments in these kinds of places. And they were. In the first half of the 20th century, most of the Central American countries were run by dictatorships, and they saw United Fruit as a means toward development, inserting their countries into the global market. Nowhere was this more the case than in Guatemala. I'm bringing in another Steve here, Stephen Kinzer. He's a former New York Times correspondent who co-authored the book Bitter Fruit about United Fruit and the CIA-backed coup in Guatemala, something which I promise we will get to in this episode. United Fruit had developed uh, an overwhelming presence in Guatemala. In fact, it was far more powerful than the Guatemalan state. It had resources far beyond anything that the local Guatemalans could come up with. And as Kinzer points out, the United Fruit Company got along very well with dictator General Jorge Ubico. He was a tyrant dressed like Napoleon Bonaparte, compared himself to Adolf Hitler, and he ran the country throughout the 1930s until 1944. He signed a contract giving United Fruit huge privileges, tax exemptions, and vast amounts of land. The tentacles of the United Fruit Company, which incidentally was known as El Pulpo, the octopus, uh, reached very deeply into Guatemalan life. It wasn't just that United Fruit contained... Uh, uh, controlled a lot of banana plantations. They also, in addition to being the largest employer in the country, uh, controlled two other important levers of power. Number one is they owned the electric company, the company that provided almost all of Guatemalans, uh, Guatemala's electric power. Number two was the railways. That's the sound of one of the old Guatemalan steam engines. Uh, United Fruit was also connected with a, another company that it controlled called the International Railways of Central America, IRCA. And that company owned the only rail line that went from the heartland of Guatemala out to the coast. There's one port in Guatemala, Puerto Barrios, and that's the port on the Caribbean. The United Fruit Company owned that port. And they owned the only train that could get you there. There was no road. That was the train that ran through Tikisate. For years, the train carried carloads of bananas on the rail lines that once ran right where the mall now stands. See, in 1936, United Fruit set up its major operations in Tikisate, then a backwater region of Guatemala near the Pacific Ocean. They built homes, production centers, roads, a hospital. Within a decade, the company employed 10,000 people there, and it was shipping millions of bananas over to the Caribbean coast and on board the company's Great White Fleet to the United States, where demand would only grow. When I traveled to Tikisate, I was looking for the ghosts of United Fruit. But I wasn't sure what I'd find. At first glance, the town seemed like any other industrial city with a big car-choked highway running through the middle. The United Fruit Pass doesn't exactly hang from signposts, though there was an old rusty water tower with a faded Coca-Cola emblem painted on the side, and I wondered if perhaps it was left over from that era. But when I started to scratch the surface a little, I found the past was just underneath. That in a minute. Hey everyone, Maximilian Alvarez here, editor-in-chief of The Real News Network. 
We're going to get you right back to the program in a sec, I promise. But really quick, I just wanted to remind y'all that The Real News is an independent, viewer and listener supported grassroots media network. We don't take corporate cash, we don't have ads, and we never ever put our reporting behind paywalls. But we cannot continue to do this work without your support. It takes a lot of time, energy, and money to produce powerful, unique, and journalistically rigorous shows like Under the Shadow. So if you want more vital storytelling and reporting like this, we need you to become a supporter of The Real News now. Just head over to therealnews.com forward slash donate and donate today. It really makes a difference. Also, if you're enjoying Under the Shadow, then you will definitely want to follow NACLA, the North American Congress on Latin America. NACLA's reporting and analysis goes beyond the headlines to help you understand what's happening in Latin America and the Caribbean from a progressive perspective. Visit NACLA.org to learn more. That's N-A-C-L-A dot org. All right. Thanks for listening. Back to the show. This was the absolute center of United Fruit production roughly 70 years ago. The heart of production across Guatemala. I'm trying to find like restages. I'm trying to find esquicios. I'm trying to find some signs of that United Fruit still here. Green wooden homes, tin roofs, uh, and then brick below. Two room, two stories. Oh, wow, it just keeps going for this, in this neighborhood here. That neighborhood is on the south side of town. It was one of several neighborhoods built to house United Fruit employees. I meet Carla Juarez there. She's the receptionist at a two-story white hotel a couple of blocks back from San Cristobal Park. Just beside the parking lot is one of the United Fruit homes, kind of collapsing and in disarray. We walk over to it. Yeah, there are many of these little houses that are still around, she tells me. They called them airplane style because of the slanted roofs. There are other smaller one-story homes, she says, that were called T-style, though she has no idea why. I stare at the home. It looks like it's been transplanted here from the United States. As one observer here later put it, the Yankee flavor replaced the Guatemalan in Tikisate. I'm not an architect, but it's the slanted gable roof that really stands out. You don't see that much here in Guatemala, except for on these United Fruit Homes. For a moment, I almost feel like I can transport myself back in time 90 years to this bustling neighborhood of hardworking farm workers coming back home from the banana fields to these rows of green two-story houses. My grandmother worked there, Carla says, for United Fruit. She was a nurse at the company hospital, so she received one just like this. Carla's grandmother passed away, but she says she and her mother still live in the home. Because we're not rich, and it costs a lot to build or move, she says. A few blocks away, I meet Antonio Granillo. He's a lawyer. He's sitting out front with his wife in their little yard at the bottom of the stairs that lead up to their former company home. I stopped to chat. They've been here for almost a decade. He says they love their home and are proud that it was from the time of United Fruit. All of the homes were like this, he says. Here, 50 years ago, they all made them like this. And they were all the same color, green. The way he describes it, the town was booming back then. The people tell this story. They get excited because the Guatemalan currency, the Quetzal, was worth more than the dollar, two to one. They say there were a lot of jobs. The Americans made a hospital here, one of the best in the country. It was all colonial, the company store, where they sold things to the workers. Back in those days, he says, big roads. It was really beautiful. This is clearly a different tikisate. And here's the thing. 
For many in town, those were the good old days. The company paid much higher wages than the average in Guatemala at the time, almost double. They provided housing. Workers poured in from the Caribbean coast and other parts of the country. A thousand miles south of New Orleans, the blue waters of the Caribbean break upon the shores of Central America. For many years, these fascinating tropical countries have been served by United Fruit Company's Great White Fleet. This promotional video was made by United Fruit in 1952. It takes Americans on a romantic tour of Guatemala, from the cities to the countryside and to the banana fields. The video shows men happily laboring in the field, carrying huge bunches of bananas and preparing them for shipment. Many of the workers employed on United Fruit Farms in Tiquisate actually came from the Caribbean coast in search of work. Ladinos, or non-indigenous Guatemalans, campesinos, and day laborers. In overt discrimination, United Fruit refused to hire those from nearby indigenous communities because the company viewed them as weak. Of course, Guatemala had another export crop, coffee. But by this time, the banana was king. And look, it was not easy work. Long hours, no rights, dangerous back-breaking labor. Banana bunches can be the size of an adult human being, holding as many as 250 bananas. As the plant bends, the bunch comes down and is caught on the shoulder of the backer. Each bunch weighs from 50 to 75 pounds. And it was dangerous. I know you've heard this song before. Daylight, come on, we wanna go home, I said, day. That's Banana Boat, a traditional Jamaican folk song popularized by Harry Belafonte. And the upbeat calypso sound makes it easy to forget that the song was actually about Caribbean workers toiling on a banana plantation. But just listen to these lyrics. Six foot, seven foot, eight foot, five. Lift six foot, seven foot, eight foot bunch, a beautiful bunch of ripe bananas, hide the deadly black tarantula. That's not even mentioning the dangerous quantities of pesticides used, the grueling hours, the forced labor, the irregular pay. There are many documented stories of employees trying to demand due wages only to be refused or fired. And so, workers in Tiquisate began to organize. El día 26 de octubre de 1944, then came the 1944 revolution, the start of Guatemala's democratic spring. A pro-democracy movement forced dictator Ubico out of office, paving the way for the first democratic elections in 1945. President Juan José Arevalo was voted into power. Amid a flurry of movement activity, Tiquisate became a hub of labor organizing. The banana workers went on strike and organized a union, the first in the country. In fact, over the next decade, they would strike repeatedly, fighting back against the octopus, United Fruit. It's an exciting time in Guatemala. The country is finally taking its first steps of democracy. President Juan José Arevalo is passing moderate reforms. Meanwhile, the United States has come out of World War II the great victor. And I think... They just uh, saw this pro-democracy movement in Guatemala, and they tolerated it for 10 years. That's Graham Russell, the founder of Rights Action. He spent roughly the last 40 years defending workers and human rights in Central America. In the first part, the, the government of Arevalo, the father, was bringing about some serious but not economic threatening reforms, uh, education reforms, health reforms, labor code reforms sort of enfranchisement, getting the vote out to indigenous people, etc. Like classic, almost liberal democracy stuff. And the U.S. was up to that point okay with it. But by 1950-51, the Cold War kicked in full bore, and the government of Guatemala did what they had to do, which was to start reforming how the economy works. That was to happen under the country's new president, Jacobo Arbenz, who had previously served as Arevalo's Minister of Defense. In 1951, Arbenz was elected into power, becoming the country's second democratically elected president. Arbenz took Arevalo's democratic revolution a step further, promising to turn the tides on the great inequality in the country 
and in particular, to roll back the power of one very prominent U.S. corporation. United Fruit was concerned, for good reason. El Coronel Arbenz puntualiza en su discurso los aspectos más trascendentales de la vida nacional. In June 1952, Arbenz decreed the country's new land reform law. In it, he stipulated that any private land over 700 acres in size that was not currently being cultivated could be expropriated by the state. At the time, less than 3% of landowners held 70% of Guatemala's arable land. United Fruit held the lion's share, over a half million acres. The majority of that land was just sitting around, not in production. The Guatemalan government expropriated more than 200,000 acres of United Fruit land. Overall, the land reform led to the expropriation of 1.5 million acres of privately held land and handed it over to 100,000 rural families, benefiting roughly half a million Guatemalans. Many of those who benefited were indigenous communities. Guatemala has the largest indigenous population of any country in Central America. 24 different ethnic groups, mostly Maya. In the first half of the 20th century, more than 50% of the population was indigenous. And like everywhere across the region, they were discriminated against and forced to work for large landowners. As we'll hear in the next episode, in the late 20th century, indigenous people in Guatemala were the victims of systematic state massacre, their villages targeted for extermination. Even today, more than 20% of Guatemala's indigenous population lives in extreme poverty, three times the rate of those living in extreme poverty for the rest of the population. Back in Arbenz's Guatemala of the 1950s, the government promised to pay for United Fruit's property. And this is great. It offered United Fruit the sum that the company itself said the land was worth according to its taxes, $1,185,000. Of course, to dodge taxes, the land value was hugely underreported by United Fruit, which is why the company demanded 16 times that figure from the government. When our Benz refused to budge, United Fruit looked to the U.S. government for help. The U.S. was happy to oblige. Top officials in Washington had deep, deep ties to the company. Then Secretary of State John Foster Dulles had worked for decades as a U.S. lawyer with a prominent law firm that often represented major U.S. corporations abroad, including United Fruit. Dulles himself had actually negotiated the contract with former Guatemalan dictator Jorge Obico. Remember the guy who liked to dress like Napoleon? And that contract had granted United Fruit huge power and enormous swaths of Guatemalan land. Author Stephen Kinzer, who we heard from earlier, says Dulles was not the company's only supporter in Washington. There was probably never an American company that was better connected in the White House than United Fruit. So all of the senior officials in the Latin America policymaking area were stockholders in United Fruit. And that included John Foster Dulles, the Secretary of State, and Alan Dulles, the head of the CIA. United Fruit had powerful supporters in Congress, especially from Massachusetts, because almost all of New England wealth was based on United Fruit. Every rich family in New England, or certainly in the greater Boston area uh, around that period, had stock in United Fruit. It was known as the blue chip investment. The tentacles of the United Fruit Company reached right into the uh, president's office because his own secretary, Ann Whitman, was married to the public relations director of United Fruit. The uh, policy planning staff at the State Department was also filled with people who had connections to United Fruit. So this company was not only uniquely powerful in Guatemala, it was uniquely powerful in Washington. Three months after Arbenz's land reform decree, President Harry Truman authorized the CIA to launch a covert operation to remove President Arbenz. A key part of that operation was a psyops war to paint Arbenz as a dangerous communist who had to be removed for the good of the region. Philip Rodinger was recruited by the Marines to join the CIA team that would attempt to overthrow the Arbenz government. He spoke to Bill Moyers for a documentary about the coup in the 1980s. It was explained to me that this is very important for the security of the United States that um, we were going to prevent a Soviet beachhead in this hemisphere, which we have heard about very recently, of course, and that uh, the Guatemalan government was communist. 
and, uh, and we had to do something about it. The truth was... Well, of course, there was no, no even a hint of communism in his government. He had no communists in his cabinet. He did permit the existence of a very small communist party. The truth didn't matter. Washington set about to create a beautifully managed propaganda war, or what we might call today a fake news campaign, to convince the public that Arbenz had to go. It was waged both in Guatemala and the United States over print and radio. And here's the thing, that framing worked, in particular because it was the same message being honed and pushed across the United States internally. The crusade for freedom is your chance and mine to fight communism. Join now by sending your contributions to General Clay, Crusade for Freedom, Empire State Building, New York City. Remember, by this time, the U.S. was firmly in the grips of the Cold War. This was the peak of McCarthyism and the so-called Red Scare. U.S. Senator Joseph McCarthy had, since 1950, been holding his trials for the Un-American Activities Committee. One communist on the faculty of one university is one communist too many. McCarthy said communism had infiltrated all parts of U.S. society. In Hollywood alone, hundreds were blacklisted for supposed communist sympathies. Lives and careers were destroyed. American advisors at Yalta was one communist too many. And while the pretext for U.S. action in Guatemala was the Cold War and the fight against communism, all of this was rooted even deeper in the Monroe Doctrine. If you remember, we talked about that in the last episode. Essentially, it's the idea that the U.S. had the right to intervene in Latin America in order to protect its own interests, in particular, to keep other foreign powers out of the region. By early 1954, the stage was almost set. Remember Secretary of State John Foster Dulles, the guy who negotiated the United Fruit contract with Guatemala's former dictator? Well, he took the campaign against Guatemala to the international stage in an attempt to drum up regional pressure against the Arbenz government. At a meeting of the Organization of American States in Venezuela in March 1954, the U.S. managed to put anti-communism at the top of the agenda. In Caracas, the 10th Inter-American Conference, hears Foreign Minister Torriello of Guatemala whose country is the target of a United States resolution against communism in the hemisphere. While accepting the resolution in principle, he warns against any concerted intervention in a nation's internal affairs. He also assails United States monopolistic interests in South America. He is followed by Secretary of State Dulles, who presses his argument for united action against what he calls the world threat of communism. They may not themselves have been communists, but they had been subjected to the inflammatory influence of communism, which avowedly uses extreme nationalism as one of its tools. The U.S. plan moved fast. Armed Guatemalan insurgents stand guard at a Honduras airstrip. Three months later, June 1954, right-wing exiled General Carlos Castillo Armas invades from Honduras, leading 500 CIA-trained soldiers into Guatemala. They lose their first fights. But U.S. pilots bomb parts of Guatemala City. A well-tooled machine of disinformation spreads phony reports that the invading force is huge, that Guatemalans are fleeing the country, that soldiers are switching sides. Fake CIA broadcasts report fake victories by a fake army of 5,000. What we wanted to do was have a terror campaign. That's Howard Hunt. He spoke to CNN about the operation years later. In 1954, Hunt was a CIA operative. Uh, to terrify our bench particularly, terrify his, his troops, much as the German Stuka bombers terrified the population of, of uh, Holland, uh, Belgium, and, uh, and Poland at the onset of World War II, and just rendered everybody paralyzed. New York, an emergency Sunday session of the United Nations Security Council. Here's a complaint While bombs the... fell on Guatemala, U.S. Ambassador to the United Nations Henry Cabot Lodge Jr., also a stockholder in United Fruit, spoke before the U.N. where he denied any U.S. role in the unfolding coup. But as a revolt of Guatemalans against Guatemalans. Our Benz would try to arm Guatemalan citizens. But it was too late. Faced with confusion, uncertainty, and fears of a bloodbath, Arbenz announces his resignation over the country's airwaves on June 27, 1954. 
nombre de qué hacen esas barbaridades? In the name of what are they committing all these barbarities? For what cause, he said. We all know that they have used the pretext of communism. The truth is very different. The truth can be found in the financial interests of the fruit company and in those other North American monopolies that have invested large capital in Latin America, fearing that the example of Guatemala would spread to the neighboring Latin American sister countries. Time will show that what I say now is true. Arbenz fled the country. Planes sweep across the skies over Guatemala City to herald the triumphal return of Colonel Castillo Armas. The invading General Castillo Armas rode into Guatemala City. Black and white U.S. newsreels painted the overthrow as a tremendous victory for freedom. For the first time in 10 years, the people of Guatemala are breathing the sweet air of liberty. Only days after the resignation of Red President Jacobo Arbenz, thousands of communists and fellow travelers are rounded up in makeshift prisons. For United Fruit, it's business as usual, as all company land seized by the communists is returned. On television, Secretary of State Dulles announces the return of democracy to Guatemala. The future of Guatemala lies at the disposal of the Guatemalan people themselves. It lies also at the disposal of leaders loyal to Guatemala who have not treasonably become the agents of an alien despotism which sought to use Guatemala for its own evil ends. The events of recent months and days add a new and glorious chapter to the already great tradition of the American states. Glorious for the United States, perhaps. Author Stephen Kinzer. That idea that the coup happened because Guatemalans were anti-communist and the twin idea that this was a coup only carried out by Guatemalans without any American help was the line that Foster Dulles preached uh, in the weeks and months afterwards. That really wasn't true. If it had not been for uh, the conflict between Guatemala's Democratic leaders and the United Fruit Company, uh, I doubt there ever would have been a coup there. It was a, a great success in the short run for the United States. We were able to place in power a person who would uh, not only bow down in front of United Fruit, but do everything else that we asked him to do. So this sent a great message also throughout all of Latin America. But protests rippled across the region. People demonstrated against the Guatemalan coup in Chile. In Mexico, painter Diego Rivera led protests joined by Frida Kahlo. It was one of the last things she did. She died two weeks later. It was also a major turning point for a young Argentine doctor named Ernesto Che Guevara. He was living in Guatemala before and during the coup. He had asked to fight. After Arbenz was overthrown, he fled to Mexico, where he would meet a radical Cuban lawyer by the name of Fidel Castro, who was planning to lead a revolution against Cuban dictator Fulgencio Batista. This was not the first U.S.-backed coup in Latin America, and it would not be the last. Remember, as I talked about in the last episode, the region had suffered under the shadow of the United States and the Monroe Doctrine for more than a century. Every country had endured its share of invasions and interventions. But 1954 Guatemala was the first coup in Latin America carried out by the CIA, which was created only seven years before, and the first in the region amid the Cold War. Piero Glaiseses is a professor of U.S. foreign policy at Johns Hopkins University. We come to the conclusion that the best guarantee against communism are the dictators. With the dictator, you don't worry whether he may be pro-communist or not. With the democratic government, the government of Arevo in Guatemala is an excellent example. You are not sure. So the dictator is better. And second, because we realize that dictators are more friendly to U.S. economic interests, American companies, than democratic governments. That was really the bottom line. Throughout the Cold War, the United States opposed reformers while backing brutal dictators across the region. Guatemala 
was the front runner. Because the U.S. was sort of in the throes of the Cold War and had convinced itself that in order to fight, you know, communism globally, it had to back anyone who was anti-communist, even if they were bloodthirsty dictators or grotesquely brutal military regimes, as was the case in Guatemala. Joe Marie Burt is a political scientist at George Mason University and a former NACLA editor. We'll hear a lot from her in the next episode. So when this government's overthrown, it sort of gives rise to just literally a series of of military governments, one more repressive than the other, you know, all with the support and backing of the United States government. The new U.S.-backed military junta cracked down on dissent. The country sank into dictatorship, repression, and a 36-year civil war that, as we will look at in depth in the next episode, would cost hundreds of thousands of lives and last until the 1990s. Social gains would be rolled back. Today, nearly 30 years after the end of the armed conflict, The promise of peace and democracy remains unfulfilled. The dismal inequality that drove the reforms of the democratic spring remain unaddressed. But something has been brewing. Remember President Juan José Arevalo, the man who ushered in Guatemala's democratic spring in 1945? Well, his son Bernardo Arevalo, he's Guatemala's president-elect. He won the 2023 elections against tremendous odds. And despite moves by the courts and the country's attorney general to block his election and inauguration, he'll be sworn in on January 14th. Today, many Guatemalans hope that Arevalo, the son, can usher in a new Guatemala, like his father did a century ago. This is huge. Lo que se están viendo, que se están enfrentando... The people have again found hope, Arevalo said during an interview after his electoral victory. And all society wants is for the democratic norms to be respected. As for United Fruit, it's interesting. But you could almost say that the Guatemalan coup marked the beginning of the end of El Pulpo, the octopus, That same year, 1954, the U.S. government brought a civil antitrust lawsuit against the company for essentially monopolizing the U.S. banana industry. Within 13 years, it would be broken up, although its descendants would continue to grow and sell bananas under the Chiquita brand until today. As for United Fruit's vast plantations in Tiquisate, they wouldn't even last as long as the company. A decade after the coup, after a devastating hurricane and banana tree disease, the company shut down production and sold its plantations there. The railroad did not last much longer. A highway up to the Atlantic coast was opened. The constant bustle of banana shipments was silenced. Now, the tracks in Tikisate sat largely unused, empty, a memory of the once bustling past, both the good and the bad. This bridge, it used to be just for the train. Like, when they built it, it was just for the, the, the train. Before leaving Tikisate, I went for a drive in search of something the jubilant 1950s newsreels and Secretary of State Dulles intentionally did not say. We just pulled into a, a big farm. A big Chiquita brand truck driving out. This is the area of the big plantations just south of Tikisate. <clears throat> right now, I mean, there's banana farms down here too, but right now where we are, just covered and covered in, uh, in palm, you know, for palm oil production. But it's also in a, it's in a place just near here, which is where they took a bunch of the union leaders back during the coup of 1954 and shot them all. And it wasn't just union leaders. It was anyone unsympathetic to the coup. The banana workers in Tikisate, they'd organized. They'd won higher wages, more rights. They'd seen their lives transformed. They'd fought and won recognition of the first union in the country, 
fought to end the harsh Ubico dictatorship in 1944, and the U.S. had just sunk them into another one. According to accounts from that time, in the days and weeks following the 1954 coup, an estimated 1,000 campesinos and workers were rounded up, brought to United Fruit's Hokotan plantation, shot, killed, and buried in mass graves. In an oral history by historian Cindy Forster, published in the book Banana Wars, one former banana worker said, At Finca Hokotan, you could hear the machine guns going all the time. It lasted four or five months. They were grabbing people from everywhere, not just Tikisate. Another campesina Forster interviewed said, Without a doubt, the company permitted the massacre since it took place on their plantation and they allowed the army to seize people. I couldn't find Hokotan. I asked around. No one I spoke with had ever heard of it. But it's out there, somewhere. The name likely changed, buried just underneath the surface, like the United Fruit Homes, like the railway, like the former banana workers, like those who resisted the coup, the footprints of Guatemala's devastating past hiding in plain sight across the country's landscape. And the story of U.S.-backed mass killings and disappearances done in the name of freedom and the fight against communism would be repeated over and over again in Guatemala. This is where we'll go in episode three. It's the fate of this region, Central America, that I want to talk to you about tonight. Into the 1980s, amid scorched earth policies and hundreds of thousands dead, encouraged with staunch support from the U.S. government, and in search of the ghosts that linger today. So I finally made it to this memorial for the disappeared here in Guatemala, and it has got to be one of the most intense and powerful and amazing and tumultuous things I've ever witnessed. Next time on Under the Shadow. Thank you so much for watching The Real News Network, where we lift up the voices, stories, and struggles that you care about most. And we need your help to keep doing this work. So please, tap your screen now, subscribe, and donate to The Real News Network. Solidarity forever.